guys. I've been in and out twice. Forgot my glasses and my water. So I'm going to try to make this fast because it's hot. It's Mother's Day and they're cooking me dinner in there and I'm thirsty. I, 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 we're doing this book haul thing, right? Because I want to get the rest of these out of here. And so I think we're going to go with, we're going to start with this one. I talked to Jared Michal, 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 it's been Americanized. <laughs> but I talked with him the other night. I had a great time talking to him. He, he has a podcast, the, um, I don't think it's the, I think it's just Modern Apocrypha. And he just talks about apologetics and fun stuff. And when he was telling about this epimyth, it was, it was just really cool. We had a great conversation. I hope I can keep most of it, but it was really long, so I'm going to have to cut some, I'm sure. But still, so this is Bright Star Energum Matrice, Matrice 6. I don't know how to say it. He told me, and I've already forgotten. But this is an autistic kid from this world. He's ripped from t here and put into a different universe whose very foundations are built on mysterious forces. There he has no memory of his past and his autism is refocused and transformed into a near superpower. And the there's a few major quotes that I want to share. It says, darkness before you and chaos behind you. In hubris and weakness, the bright star will blind you. I don't know what that means, but it sounds interesting, right? And then you must face your past before you can find your future. That's kind of a, if you, if you think about it, that's like the impetus for salvation. You recognize your past, your sinful self. And once you can do that, then, oh, that's cool. That's really cool. And then it says, an epic space adventure, Bright Star introduces readers to a myth in the tradition of authors like C.S. Lewis, written to draw readers into the most important stories and values of Western civilization, follow Nate's journey through the backdrop of an exciting yet thoughtful space fantasy. So it's, it's not super long. It's considered YA. And yeah, I love the cover. I think it's really cool. And the reason I'm, I decided to show this one first is I'm going to stick a couple of um, pictures. Right? My daughter and I went out last night to see what we could see from the Aurora Borealis that is over Southern California. Some local people have gotten some incredible pictures. I think we went too late because one of the best pictures from last night was taken in Death Valley at nine and we were told 11 to two. So we went at like 12 thinking, you know, right in the middle there. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, we got, we, we can, because of what I saw from a friend in Ohio as it waned, I can see that what we thought we were trying to decide is the city lights that are creating this or is it whatever? No, it was actually, we did get some photos. I'll put a couple in here, but, um, so anyway, uh, Jared Mashad, I'm really looking forward to reading this. It's entirely possible that this will get, I'm not even taking it out to my room because I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, I wonder if I should put this over here, really hoping that I can start it actually like right away. So there's that. Then Tyndale sent me Chris Fabry's next book and all the media sheets are there. It is The Forge and it is kind of a sequel for, if I recall correctly from what he had told me. And that's, if I recall correctly, I think it's a, a, a form or a, a definite, one of the two, of a sequel to The War Room. And apparently there is a movie already, and then he has written the novel for it. Now, I'm going to be totally fair. He did, I think, a novelization of... I don't think it was courageous. It was something else. And to me, it felt like a novelization of a movie instead of just a book of its own. It didn't grab me. I was not thrilled about it, but I do definitely want to read this because I do enjoy his writing. And that one just might have just not been the book for me because I've read books by him since then that I loved. So 
I wanted to, I wanted to see specifically this one since it was a movie first and he is writing the novelization. Was it just that book? Was it where I was at the time, or do I not like? novels written based on movies. I don't know. We're going to find out. But The Forge, it says, as Cynthia writes, marriage implodes. She is forced to raise her teenage son, Isaiah, alone. The pressure of providing for them through her salon is a full-time job in itself. When Cynthia sees Isaiah pulling away and escaping into video games, tensions rise and prayers feel unanswered. Angry and hurt, Isaiah starts acting like the father who abandoned him, and Cynthia gives him an ultimatum an ultimating? An ultimating. Uh, Cynthia gives him an ultimatum while turning to her twin sister, Elizabeth Jordan, for support. Elizabeth enlists Miss Clara, a seasoned prayer warrior, who challenges Cynthia to pray boldly and believe God for the impossible. So, I'm looking forward to reading this. I, I really am. Uh, the War Room is, is not one that I've read, and I have not seen the movie. But I've talked to people who I respect who have seen the movie, and it definitely uh, sounds like something I should read, right? Um, I don't even know what it's all here. So next up, I have the third and final Cape Cod Creamery by Suzanne Woods Fisher. This is women's fiction, the romantic women's fiction. This one's going to have another um, romance thread for sure, but it's definitely women's fiction. Um, she's calling it contemporary romance, or the publisher is, but the all of them have been really focused on these female relationships and how they help each other with their interpersonal relationships. So there's that. So it says she met the man of her dreams and married him and then ran away. Convinced she's found the missing piece in her life, Bryn Haywood finds herself saying I do to a man whom she's known less than 24 hours the dawn reveals a different truth, sending Bryn into a state of panic. In the, in the quiet morning hour, she slips away, leaving her new husband in peaceful slumber and flees to Cape Cod in a swirl of uncertainty and self-doubt. And then, this sounds like there's some suspense. It says, unbeknownst to Bryn, her 24-hour husband is closing in on her whereabouts. Soon she'll be faced with a choice that will test the depths of her newfound strength and power of love to heal and transform. I don't know if that's good or bad. I can't decide. I could see it going either way. Like this guy is, there's something, that's what she ran from. Or he's actually a great guy who's going to find her and he's going to fight for her. I don't know which this is going to be, but it's going to have a bakery in it. So yes, <laughs> we all need a little bit of bakery in our lives. So I got that one. And then this, as far as I know, is the last in the Climbing Higher series. It's number three, Why the Mountain Stand by Ashlyn Michaela Ohm. And this series, have I read the first one? I feel like I've read the first one. I have not read the second one. I can't recall if I've read the first one or not. But this series, every time I talk to her about these books, I'm just like, I got to get into them. Um, I don't know if we talked about the first one. We definitely talked about the second and the third. But it's two sisters and how they kind of help each other. It's, again, I think it's romantic women's fiction, but it's primarily women's fiction. Anyway, it says, Coaching figure skating at an athletic center in Whistler, Canada seems like a dream come true to Addison Miles especially since it offers an opportunity to pursue her relationship with Darius, the man who's become more than a friend. But her excitement fades when she's assigned to coach Daniel's troubled cousin. Withdrawn and turbulent, Kenzie Howard is also an unsettling reminder of Addison's own shadowed past. But when Kenzie rediscovers a local legend, Addison realizes that there's more at stake than either of them expected. Helping Kenzie means risking her job at the center and even her relationship with Darius, but it could also set Addison free from the shame she's carried for years. So Why the Mountain Stand, this one we go from Colorado, now we're in Canada, and this Climbing Higher series, it just, it, when you talk to the author, you really get a sense of her absolute love of the Lord and how it's, she infuses that in the books. 
It says, A Tale of Redemption and Restoration, Why the Mountain Stand is the climatic finale to the Climbing Higher series, celebrating the healing power of friendship and the transforming promise of faith. So, yes, yes, it's, it's time that I at least make sure I've read the first one. And if I have, I'm pretty sure I read an ebook. But if I have, then get to the second one because I, I really want to read it. But I can't until I know what I've done and I haven't taken the time to look. Okay, this one, I don't recall why I bought it. The Finder's Keepers Library. The only thing better than a good book is sharing with someone you love. Um, this In this charming story of love, laughter, and finding your way, bestseller Annie Rains, uh, bestselling author, sorry, Annie Rains, shows us that the sun always shines after the rain. Um, I don't know. It's women's fiction. I don't know where I found this. I can't recall who mentioned it. Somebody mentioned it somewhere. And I read the synopsis and went, yes, I want to, I want to read more. So it says, for a gardener blessed with green thumbs, Savannah Collins' life sure seems like it's all thorns, zero roses. She has no job, no relationship, and no place to live. With nothing but a car full of plants and her, her new rescue kitten, Savannah heads to Bloom, North Carolina to spend the summer with her beloved Aunt Eleanor, a retired librarian. Her aunt shells her shells? She shells. Her aunt shares the love of literature through the Finders Keepers Library, located in her beautiful garden where anyone can step by to pick a book or leave a book. When a sudden summer storm destroys the library and many of the roses, it will take a village to get everything ready for the garden wedding that is planned there in just three weeks. And, you know, it just sounds like it's going to be a nice community story. I hope I love this. Please, Lord, let me love this book. because It just sounds fun and great and bookish because books. So have you read it? Do I want to read it? Yeah, right? Um, momentous events in the life of a hatrix I've been, by Dusty Bowling. I've been told I'm not likely to like this one as much as the first one, but that I won't dislike it. I can handle that. I can handle that. So, just when Avon Green begins to feel comfortable at Stagecoast Pass, everything changes. While the first days of high school are hard enough for anyone, they're about as much fun as doing the YMCA for Avon, who was born without arms. And when some high school kids humiliate her, not only does Avon lose her newfound confidence, she pushes away the most important people in her life. Avon never imagined high school would start like this. Then again, she never imagined she would make an earth-shattering DNA discovery ride a horse with hundreds of people watching, join a punk rock band, and experience her first kiss. In a year full of so much change, can she manage to stay true to herself? <sighs> so, I think I'm going to like it, and I agree, I think I'm not going to like it as much, but she was fun, and I want to see. This one I suspect I won't keep, but I'm still keeping the first one, because I really did really like the first one. Okay, and then I got a couple of E. Nesbitts. One is The House of Arden by E. Nesbitt. Look at that illustration. I love E. Nesbitt. She wrote The Railway Children by Children in It. The Enchanted Castle, I think. Um, Badge of Arden's house draws near. Make me brave and kind and wise and show me where the treasure lies. The famous Arden family treasure has been missing for generations and the last members of the Arden line, Edred, Elfrida, and their Aunt Edith have nothing to their names but the crumbling castle they live in. Just before his 10th birthday, Edred, yeah, that's how you say it. Edred inherits the title of Lord Arden. He also learns that the missing fortune will be his if and only if he can find it before he turns 10. Da, da, da. With no time to lose, Edred and Elfrida secure the help of a magical talking creature, the temporal mental mud pulled the warp. Well, no, I think there's a, okay, that makes more sense. I think there's something on the book. Moldwarp. That makes so much more sense. There's like this little something on it turning my O into a P. <laughs> so the Moldwarp who leads them on a treasure hunt through the ages. Together, brother and sister visit some of the most thrilling periods of history and test their wits against real witches, highwaymen, and renegades. They find plenty of adventure, but 
Will they find the treasure before Edred's birthday? Ian Esbitt has been a favorite of such writers as C.S. Lewis, J.K. Rowling, and Margaret Atwood. Well, two out of three is not bad. Anyway, <laughs> with the republication of the House of Arden, Nesbitt fans will, both new and old, will delight in the freshness of her humor and the breadth of her imagination. So, yeah. Um, yeah. This sounds really good. I like the idea of, like, travel through history. That sounds like... Ugh. No, I can't do this right now. I can just deal with it later. Just sit there for now. And then also The Lark by E. Nesbitt. Um, a charming and brilliantly entertaining novel shot enough with light-hearted Nesbitt, with the light-hearted Nesbitt torch. Uh, when did two girls of our age have such a chance as we've got to have a lark entirely on our own? No chaperone, no rules, no present income for future prospects, said Lucilla. It's 1919 and Jane and her cousin Lucilla leave school to find that their guardian has gambled away their money, leaving them only with a small cottage in the English countryside. In an attempt to earn their living, the orphaned cousins embark on a series of misadventures, cutting flowers from their front garden and selling them to passers-by, inviting paying guests who disappear without paying, all the while endeavoring to stave off the attentions of male admirers in a bid to secure their independence. It sounds like fun. It sounds a little different from hers. It, it's clearly not children, you know, but I was like, Yes, because Nesbitt, yes. And then, so I talked to Deb and Bruce Potts, Love on Life Support. They are marriage counselors, and they decided to put all their experience of helping others work through marriage problems and stuff into a book and fictionalize it to kind of help. And it sounds really good. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. They, I believe they sent me this copy. I think they, they graciously gave me this copy. I'm not sure that I bought it. I know I was going to them, but I think they sent it instead. So it says, Chris and Amy have all the good things in life. Two smart kids, a fancy house, and a picturesque town, good paying jobs, and expensive cars. But what they don't have is unconditional love for each other. Then, after years of unhealthy patterns in their tumultuous marriage and their on-again, off-again faith journey, the unthinkable happens. Just as a worldwide pandemic is declared, Chris is hospitalized with a life-threatening condition, and Amy is forced to leave Chris at the emergency room doors. Their old patterns don't work anymore. She can no longer control their lives, and Chris can no longer hide from his problems. And I'll just, I'm just going to stop there. So, it sounds, it sounds really good. And uh, talking to the, talking to the authors, it was a hoot. They were so much fun. He he is very much a, an organized, um, scheduled guy. He had spreadsheets for his spreadsheets, and he uh, I told him that I they needed to write a book um, between the spreadsheets <laughs> because it would be really a good kind of whatever he. They decided in like August, I think it was that they were either May or August that they were going to write this book. I think it was August, and he decided it would be done by November. <laughs> And she was just like, you're so cute. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading this and and seeing how it goes. We'll see. I think, I think I'm going to like it. So that's pretty cool. And then I got, I think maybe, was it Chantal or was it Marianne? I don't know who was talking about it, but I got a copy on eBay. It is The Beatrice Prophecy by Kate DiCamillo. And I love the end papers. Do you know how much trouble I have finding pretty end papers? I'm just saying. Oh, it's double-sided. That's cool. Look at the Herald. That's gorgeous. Wow. Okay. So, um... It doesn't tell me anything about it because there's no dust jacket. There are beautiful illustrations. So, but this says, It is written in the Chronicles of Sorrowing that one day there will come a child who will unseat a king. The prophecy states that this child will be a girl. Because of this, the prophecy has long been ignored. So, I think we're going to find out what happens when it happens. <laughs> 
I'm just going to see if I can find a couple of the bigger illustrations. Sounds like there's some, um, I don't think I can, I don't think I'm showing them very well, but it sounds like there's some really interesting stuff going on. So we shall see. Um, it sounded great when whoever it was told me about it, you know, in her, in her video, it was all for me, of course. <laughs> hey, sometimes these things just come out weird. Anyway, and so because of that, I, I had to have it. And I think I paid like, I don't know, three or four bucks shipped. So I can't complain about that. Um, and then I got another one that I wasn't going to get. I was, I just wasn't interested. It sounded like it was pretty frivolous and maybe a little just too straight up romancy for me but then I read about it somewhere don't know where anyway it sounded like there was a lot more depth to it than I expected so I got D.E. Stevenson's The Young Clementina um it said and this is why I think I think I read this back and then you'll kind of see why but it says, love, loss, and love again. Charlotte Dean enjoys nothing more than the solitude of her London flat and the monotonous days of her work as a travel, at a travel bookshop. But when her younger sister unceremoniously bursts into her quiet life one afternoon, Charlotte's world turns topsy-turvy. Beloved author D.E. Stevenson captures the intricacies of post-World War I England with a, sl with a light, sorry, common touch that perfectly embodies the spirit of the time. Alternately heartbreaking and witty, the young Clementina is a touching tale of love, loss, and redemption through friendship. So, no, that's not the back that I read because I would have bought it. This is what someone else read that made me buy it. Now I remember. So, yeah, um, I love Stevenson. And I don't expect that this will be like one of my top favorites of hers, but it sounds really good. And finally, since I did half of them on that other video, I'm so glad I did that. Um, finally, I have another book by Sarah McKenzie. It's Because Barbara. I mean, with a title like that, I had to get it right. But Because Barbara, and it's about Barbara Cooney, the artist who did like Miss Rumpheus and the Oxcart Man. And I'm trying to remember what all. So it's another Wax Wings book. Isn't it beautiful? And... Um, it's just, it's so beautiful. It tells the story about how she didn't paint well at first. So it says, at home in New York, she watched her mother paint. You try, Barbara, her mother urged. And because Barbara did whatever she set her mind to, she painted. But alone in her room, the colorful sprays of wildflowers, the sparkling waves of the ocean didn't show up on the page. Not yet. Oh, to paint like mama, thought Parker. So, it shows her growing up. And then, she wanted to illustrate, but they wouldn't let her use color. And then, look at that. I mean, ah, it's just so beautiful. I'd like to draw those chickens. <laughs> And she ends up having children and look at, look at her with her kids. I just, I just love who she became and how she just, it just shows everything that she did and all the places she went to visit. And it sounds like she must have had an incredibly neat marriage for a husband, you know, I'd have a husband who's just letting his wife go off, you know, piggledy piggledy while she does this stuff. And so, but then at the end, it, there's a little bit about the author herself. So about her as a mother, she was a playful mother, an adventurous world traveler, an avid gardener, a merrymaker, a greedy and generous reader, a picnicker of the first water, and a prolific illustrator. And then, oh yeah, I forgot about, I forgot about several of these. I have all of these books except for Basket Moon. I feel like I should buy it since it's on the page there. 
And can I just say, I think it's really adorable that they put the ISBN number cockeyed. It makes me so happy. I don't know why. But it says scan to access the audio version of the book. So if you buy the book, then you can get the audio by using the QR thing. So yeah, I had to have it because yes. Oh, look at the cat. This is how I love cats in pictures and in other people's houses. But kittens can come over any day, all day. I'm good. <laughs> so anyway, um, those are the books that I've been hoarding and you know plus the ones that were from the other day and so now they all get to get put away and yeah it's it's a book or two but that's okay because now I can put them away so I hope you had a wonderful weekend I mean I think this is going to come out on Thursday but you know still there's one coming up I'm going down south it's grandbaby's birthdays and so I'm going to go see the girlies and and have fun but in the meantime what you reading lately what do I need I, I found a few books to get rid of um, so I'm kind of excited about that you know books that I, I DNF'd a book last week so that one and possibly possibly the others in a series I read the third book in that in that author series first and so I might just check the other books um, because I loved that third one in that series and I'm a little nervous now and so I'm like why don't I just get rid of the first two because I know I loved the third and I want to keep it that way so I just do that and <laughs> I know that sounds weird but um, and I'm looking forward to a book that she's got coming out it's just that one not so much but I'll talk about that later hope you have a great week and I'll see you on Monday pray my husband sleeps <laughs>